Good morning, everyone. Morning, wonderful to see you. Uh, lovely to be here in Johannesburg. I'm from Cape Town, so it was a, a, a delight for me to um, experience the potholes of Johannesburg and to come up um, for a day or so to talk to TransUnion. I'm always very afraid of talking to TransUnion because I'm convinced that TransUnion knows a lot more about me than my own wife does, actually. So, um, you know, I'm going to be very careful as to what I say today. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's always good for an MC to put words in the mouth of a speaker. I was told to be positive in terms of this introduction. I'm going to give you a sort of a, a, a bad, ugly, and good perspective of where we are in South Africa. I like to be a realist, and I also obviously also like to look at some of the indicators that I think will provide us with some hope going forward. So if you stick it out long enough through the bad news part of the presentation, maybe there'll be a glimmer of hope towards the end. So do stick around, and if you feel as though you're getting a little bit tense, I don't know if they served uh, champagne this morning or a mimosa, which you really need to get through my presentations early in the morning, you know, open up your hip, hip flask and have something. Now, um, uh, what I want to do with you really is to take you on a tour of uh, sort of where the world is at. I think we've all uh, to some degree been through um, a, a rather risky uh, last number of years or so. Uh, it hasn't been easy for anyone anywhere in the world. And it doesn't matter where I do a presentation. There is unease, angst, concern, not just about the broader macroeconomic issues, but about political policy issues. And in particular, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the concern is about leadership and the quality of leadership as well. If I was giving a talk in the... It, it, it's so much easier for me to talk in, in South Africa. I actually think we are a very mature audience here in South Africa. We have become quite self-critical perhaps a little bit too much so, but we are prepared to look into our own issues. We are prepared to admit now where we've gone wrong. And it's not just me, Daniel, from Cape Town saying what's gone wrong. Government themselves are admitting what's gone wrong. And as you know, for those of you who've got a, an addiction problem, when you begin to own up to what's gone wrong, you're on your way to a degree of recovery. And in a sense, in South Africa, we're going through that particular stage at the moment. So you'll forgive me when I talk about some of the negative issues which are important in setting the scene for where we are into the future. Now, again, it doesn't matter where I'm presenting. And I do present in various countries across the world, all of us have gone through a period, and we are going through now, and possibly for the rest of, uh, uh, well, maybe for the rest of our lives for that matter, crisis after crisis, or as us analysts say, a world of polycrises. Listen, the backdrop for the world is tough. Climate change is affecting all of us in everything that we do, and I think it needs to be an issue that is in the forefront of our minds on every aspect of business going forward. Inflation, which wasn't just a feature of the Russia-Ukraine invasion, uh, which wasn't just a feature of COVID, this inflationary tendency, I believe, was there because of easy money that was available via the US Fed for many years prior to COVID. That's taken its toll on all countries across the world. And of course, for us in South Africa, we are part and parcel of a global economy, and whether we like it or not, and there are a lot that don't like it, we are susceptible to that. We are susceptible to the US Fed, the value of the US dollar, and of course, to the influence of US interest rates as well. And of course, much of the discussion about, uh, you know, new power blocks in the world, and I'll come to it in a little bit in the presentation on the issue of BRICS and how to take BRICS forward as an alternative grouping in the world, centers around being less reliant, being less influenced by what happens in Washington in particular. But it doesn't matter where I am. If I was giving a presentation in Argentina today, believe me, this would be an issue and this would impact upon that country's economy, which is in a lot worse position than we are in South Africa. So for those of you thinking about emigrating to to Argentina, and I know there are a lot in this particular room, be careful there. Their interest rates are well over 100%, and their inflation rate is creeping up to almost 200% in Argentina at the moment. Now, the world has been rough 
Interest rate rises, and of course, the effects on the banking sector has been substantial. You've seen some of the household names in the world. Who ever thought that an anchor tenant in the financial services industry like uh, Credit Suisse would undergo the problems that it has had in the last while? And of course, the backdrop to all of these global stress points is certainly amplified by the Russian invasion of the Ukraine giving, of course, a headache to President Putin in Moscow, just how to extricate himself from a disastrous foreign policy. But it's not just him, I might add, that is scratching his head. Global leaders across the world are scratching their head with a degree of headaches in terms of dealing with those crises and dealing with what could very well be a world where we do enter another kind of Cold War, a Cold War 2.0. So the backdrop is tough and the backdrop is rough doesn't matter where you are. From a global economic perspective, we're looking at dipping growth, GDP growth globally this year, but certainly I think from next year we will start to see some upticks occurring in the major markets going forward. And indeed, you know, there is an excitement about the African continent going forward. I travel quite a bit across Africa just in the last month or so. There's an excitement when you go to Kenya, and the Kenyans tell me they're going to grow at 5% GDP over the course of the next year. I said to my Kenyan friends, that's fantasy stuff for us in South Africa. We're not even going to do 0.5% here in this country. They're going to do 5% going forward. If you take a look at some of those big picture GDP figures coming out of next year, or so I'm going to turn for the moment to the back because I can see more clearly here, we, South Africa expected to do about 0.5, 0.6% this year if we are lucky. The big growth, the big growth regions of this world, certainly China, I'll come to China in a moment because it's more complex, but the big growth success story of this year and possibly next year and maybe even for the next few years is India. 6% growth coming out of a country with 1.4 billion people. It's pretty impressive stuff coming out of India, but there's more excitement in other parts of the world. Indonesia looks good. Philippines looks good. Uh, and of course, some African economies, as long as they can be relatively stable, like uh, Senegal, where I was recently, 6-7%. Great potential, Mozambique here on our doorstep as well. So, you know, the global economy is on a low for this year after bouncing back from COVID, but it does look just that little bit better next year. The good news from an inflationary point of view is that the input costs that have affected inflation across the world look as though they are softening and softening quite dramatically as well. Commodity prices are down, although we're not out of the woods just yet. Food prices are down, but we're also not just out of the woods just yet. Uh, US CPI inflation down, although not quite out of the woods just yet. We've seen a small uptick in inflation, but nevertheless coming back towards manageable levels, and that would indicate that there's a potential of a plateau in interest rates, but with the possibility of perhaps one or two more minor interest rate hikes still coming through in the process. So we are not out from a global perspective or from a U.S. Fed perspective, which influences us here in South Africa, of the possibility of facing one or two more minor interest rate hikes as I speak here. Uh, headline CPI inflation in general is starting to drop as a result of these input costs looking a, lo looking a lot better. But the variables, the risk factors remain. And I think this clearly doesn't make any of us sleep better. And again, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. Issues relating to rising food prices, that uh, pressure on grain prices as well, if the war in Ukraine continues along the path that it is taking, can upset some of these trend lines going forward. And I think we have to be realistic about expecting at least some modicum of interest rate rise increase from the US Fed as a result of those big risk factors still very much being with us uh, going forward. Crude benchmark US crude futures oil looking that bit better, but for those of you going on a vacation into the United States right now, you're going to be paying about $4 a gallon. It's up quite substantially. The Russians and the Saudis certainly trying to control the price of oil, and that will also potentially filter through into an inflationary cycle that becomes just slightly more problematic. So I'm a little bit more cautious. You can see those CPI inflation graphs going down. I'm a little bit more cautious that 
some of these issues are going to keep nagging, biting at those interest rates and preventing them from really beginning what should be for all of us some sort of ameliorating fall in future. So I think it's going to be higher for longer when you look at some of these uncertainties in the world. Uh, bankruptcy filings in the United States certainly on the up. You can't continue to put up interest rates at the rate that you've had without having some damaging effect on your economy. And you're seeing this coming through in the United States now, just not, not just on this particular issue, but in the property sector as well. Um, expectations of that interest rate cycle drop are there, but I think we should just be a little bit more cautious down the line and in future as well. Uh, in the United States in particular, it's an important issue for us here in South Africa. We are seeing higher U.S. yields for longer, and that means there's more dollar buying in the marketplace, and that keeps the dollar pretty high and affects, obviously, the rand dollar exchange rate going forward. As you expect those interest rates to remain that bit higher for longer, there's more buying into that higher yield currency like the U.S. dollar, and that affects our rand. So just when you think the rand is going to start improving a little bit, and you on your visit to the United States and you want a few more runts in your pocket or dollars in your pocket, now this issue comes back to bite you. From a U.S. Western perspective, we are also, and I flag this as a key issue to watch in future, we are looking at mounting gov government debt, not just in the U.S., but in other major economies as well. I'll come back to government debt in South Africa as well. Just flag this, because this can have a risk-inducing factor into the global economy in future. And, of course, talking about risk and talking about politics, and you think our politics is fun here in South Africa, man, oh, man, you just have to watch CNN or Fox or one of your favorite channels, wherever you happen to be, and you will see the fun and games happening in the United States. Reminds me a bit of South Africa, strangely enough, and politics in the United States just shows you. It doesn't matter where you are politicians and their issues going forward. Now, lastly, on the macro side, very important uh, trading partner for South Africa, China. China is our largest single trading partner. What happens in China, if China catches a cold to some degree, we also are going to get the sniffles. And China at the moment has got something of what I would regard as a low-intensity cold. It hasn't adequately bounced back from those heavy restrictions uh, uh, as a result of COVID. Its economy certainly is looking a lot softer, and those growth projections for China over the next few years are nowhere near the 10, 8, 7 percent that they've seen for the last decade or so. China's going to start to grow much more like other countries, 4, 5 percent or so, if they are lucky. Weak economic growth reported in the last reporting period, just uh, in positive terms, I might add. And China has had all sorts of issues relating to the economy in the last few years. The property sector in particular has been problematic. There's an oversupply of property. There's the inability of, uh, 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 to repay debt on property in China as well. It's having that negative effect on the economy. And those headline figures coming out of China just in the last week or so, retail sales dull in China. The Chinese are not spending enough domestically. Gosh, you know, they want their people to spend, and they're not spending sufficiently. Um, industrial production off the boil. There's less exports coming out of China. If the Chinese economy looks to be soft, it will affect our economy as well. It'll affect other African economies because we export commodities into China. We want their property and building and industrial sector to work. And if it is that bit slower, those exports coming out of the developing world are going to be that bit slower. So, you know, I do think these big macro factors obviously impact South Africa and impact us quite substantially. So it's not just all our fault as to what's happening, as to why we have this sluggish economy in, in this country. Yes, we haven't built up enough of our own expertise to withstand these global pressures, and we'll come to that in a moment. Now, the best way for me to describe South Africa as we move into the second part of the presentation is really to use this perhaps overworn quote. Everybody claims to have said this particular quote, by the way. I couldn't, I mean, I researched for hours. I mean, for hours. I charged TransUnion for 
hours just to find out who said this. It's always darkest before dawn. Is it biblical? Is it some, who knows, some, some, some motivational speaker who wants you to feel better about where things are going? It's ascribed to Dan Brown in this particular image that I've put up on the screen. Everything is ascribed to Dan Brown, so I just thought I'd put him in as uh, the source of this quote. And perhaps it's not, I shouldn't be that flippant about it. Because I do think we are kind of in a position of darkness, but I do see that there is a dawn on the horizon. Now, let me, let me just highlight in this first part of my second part of this presentation where the rot, where the rot lies in South Africa. And perhaps you don't need me to tell you where the rot lies because you know where the problems are, but let me give you some background. And for our rather beleaguered president, President Rabaposa, by his own admission, uh, it's a very rough and tough environment for any South African leader in the post-1994 scenario. Probably the toughest period to be a leader. So let's cut him some slack, at least for the moment. Uh, and you've got to cut him some slack as well. When you look to see some of these issues that he has had to deal with over the course of the last two, three, four years or so. Issues surrounding former President Jacob Zuma continues to be uh, uppermost in the mind of many South Africans, but Ramaphosa had to manage, ultimately, the removal of the importance of Jacob Zuma from the ANC and South African political life. And the ANC is still battling with that particular issue. And perhaps what we've seen is the efforts and very creative efforts over the course of the last week to keep Jacob Zuma out of jail, another rather heavy-handed way in which the ANC is trying to limit the possible risk to some sort of Zuma incarceration. But nevertheless, Zuma faces corruption charges, and we're not out of the woods on that issue. But secondly, President Ramaphosa has, has had to deal with state capture issues. He's had to deal with some of his most senior comrades falling foul of the law. And when you look at the tough way in which this has been dealt with, messy in part, one has to have some sympathy for the president as he tries to keep his own party together, a fractious and fragmented political party facing not only economic pressure, but political pressure as well. And our president, of course, has had sleepless nights, waking up to that cock crowing pala pala in the distance as well. It hasn't been an easy period for him at all, but obviously the issue of energy shortages, power outages, load shedding, Blackouts, let's call it blackouts because that's what it is, has had that really negative effect on our economy. And we have been stuck just above the breadline in terms of our own GDP growth. We're not in a recession, which I think is perhaps positive at least when you think about stage four or stage six load shedding for most of this year. The fact that we are not in a recession is, in a sense, tantamount to some encouraging signs of the resilience and ability of South Africans to get on with their life and to manage the challenges that we have with us. And that sounds all glib and rather nice and positive, but this country cannot just grow on 0.5% GDP. It's not a job-creating figure. That's all we need to understand about GDP. If you're going to create jobs in South Africa, you need a GDP that's growing at 3, 4, 5%. We're a developing nation, 60 million people here in Africa. We should be growing at 4 or 5% like the Kenyans are growing at the moment. So the target, we're very far away from what I would see as our target growth at the moment. And the effect of power blackouts in South Africa has had a disastrous effect on our GDP growth. The South African Reserve Bank, in their analysis, and many companies have put out an analysis of what that effect has been quantified in terms of GDP growth, puts the loss to our GDP at about 2%, at least 2% per annum. So if the lights were on all the time, to simplify that, we should be having a growth rate of about 25 to 3% GDP, which would be an adequate starting block for us to begin to reverse the last 15 years of poor policy management in South Africa and begin that necessary reboot and long overdue reboot that we need. So you can just see how the energy crisis has really held South Africa back going forward. 
The energy crisis is one factor that has also contributed to this continued malaise in employment within the country. Now, the latest employment figures came out this week. It showed a marginal dip in unemployment in South Africa. It's always good to show something that looks a little bit better than the previous reporting period, but that dip was very marginal. It's not enough for any economists or analysts to get really excited uh, and to say that the South African economy has turned the corner. Nevertheless, at least statistically, we can show that there's been about 150,000 jobs created in South Africa over the course of the last uh, uh, reporting period, the last quarter or so. Um, and it, you know, again, in looking for more positive attributes of our economy, it looks as though that plateau of darkness has been reached. And perhaps now we, begin, we can begin to look at some degree of dawn going forward. But it's been tough. It's been tough for you in the private sector. It's been tough for the big names who have had huge costs attached to the energy crisis itself. The costs of running that generator. The additional impact on consumer price inflation as a result of those input costs have clearly affected the South African consumer. Uh, business confidence linked ultimately to load shedding. And you can plot the power outages and you can plot that drop in business confidence as stage four and stage six sets in. So, you know, again, you can see that negative effect. South Africa, like many other countries across the world, also faces a potential problem in future on the issue of government debt. Now, to prop up our economy, we have been borrowing, and borrowing quite a lot. There was a hope a couple of years ago, 24 months, that we would be able to reduce our debt component to GDP. Well, I don't think we're going to be able to reduce that. We're going to have to pump more money into energy, into diesel, and frankly, into critical infrastructure over the next immediate period, and into social services as well. And that's going to boost, again, our debt-to-GDP position within South Africa. So we have to flag this, if I'm being realistic as an economist, we have to flag this as an issue for South Africa going forward. Now, all of these issues have had a detrimental effect on the South African uh, consumer. When you look at those input costs that the average consumer has had to bear over the course of the last uh, two years or so, electricity, of course, going up the tremendously, medical insurance, water and other services, all of those costs really present a risk to the consumer and, of course, present a risk to business. And if we want to be a society where the consumer portion of our economy grows, those costs have certainly run against that. Ultimately, ultimately, our electricity price increases have run at three times the uh, level of food price increases in South Africa. And that has shrunk the spending pool, and it's shrunk all of the associated businesses that rely upon that. And when you look at these figures, and you look at the difficulties that South Africans have had in order to afford what they used to afford, and you look at the real data, South Africans have been getting poorer. Our per capita income looks as though it is certainly not growing, as it is growing, I might add, in many other countries on this particular continent. Now, the better news is that we are beginning in line with global trends to see uh, the beginnings of a better inflationary outlook. Again, commodity prices again looking that bit better all of the other input costs looking just a little bit better, helping uh, the inflation rate in South Africa to come back into the Reserve Bank's uh, preferred range, which is important. But again, you know, one has to flag one of the risk factors in this country, which is the value of the rand, and that low level of the rand at the moment, at 1920 or so to the US dollar, just before I got on stage, also is a contributory factor, certainly, to imported inflation into South Africa. So I do think the RAND needs to regain some strength. We can talk at nauseam about what's fair value for the RAND. Well, i just like to see the RAND get back to about 18 or 17 to the dollar. I don't expect great things over the course of the next while or so. For big business, uh, 
big names have been pummeled, profits pummeled, inflation has certainly had its effect, uh, and high interest rates as well. Consumer confidence not looking too good, as you can see on the chart, and consumer confidence is not just affecting those lower income groups, it's affecting medium and higher spenders as well. And whichever way you look at the stats, you can see that rather depressing influence going forward. I wanted to put in a chart which would have shown a slightly better view of the retail sector today because the retail sales figures came out yesterday for the last reporting period. And again, we're now in the seventh consecutive month of shrinking retail sales within South Africa. Not surprising, you can't have rising retail sales with this level of interest rate increase and this level of economic stagnation. And we know, we know the risk factors that are affecting South Africa's consumers. This is what they're thinking about, high fruit prices, load shedding, fuel prices. All of these issues are seen as high risk issues for the South African consumer and for the poorer end of the market. It's tough. It's tough to put a little bit of food on the table. And for many consumers, there is now an increase in borrowing just to put food on the table. Borrowing just to get a grocery basket, uh, a, a gro grocery basket into, your, uh, into your home. So the interest rate cycle continues, I think, to be a drain on South Africa, uh, as it is in many other parts of the world, but in a poor economy with a very high poor and, and poverty-stricken part of our population, this really is an added burden on them. The forecast for interest rates, therefore, similar to what I'm saying about the United States and elsewhere, I think interest rates higher for longer in South Africa, um, not necessarily spiking higher, but plateauing at a higher level and perhaps only looking at some modicum of reduction, I would argue, in the earlier part of next year, not this year for the moment. And I'll tell you why um, when I do the two charts um, from now. Uh, the weak economy certainly um, has taken the shine off private sector credit. And again, you can see the charts reflecting that. And you can see the effects of all of these issues. Home prices as well, dipping, perhaps not so much in Cape Town, I might add, where I am, but dipping in other parts. I saw some wonderful properties here available as I was driving from the airport. I think I need to semigrate back up to um, Johannesburg in order to improve my own lifestyle. But obviously, those property values looking very iffy going forward, having a knock-on negative effect. So South Africans are being, they're being, they're, they're being squeezed. They're being squeezed in terms of higher interest rates. They're spending on other products, on other services are being squeezed and squeezed quite substantially. From a political pers perspective, because I'm a political economist, the interest rate story is really interesting. You're moving into an election cycle of next year, which I will touch on in a moment, and in that election cycle, no sitting political party wants to have rising interest rates as one of the key issues in an election campaign, especially with a large poor population within South Africa. And I think there'll be tremendous pressure on the South African Reserve Bank in the course of the first half of next year. We expect an election anywhere between May of next year and September or October at the latest next year. In the first quarter of next year, I would expect there to be tremendous pressure on the Reserve Bank to begin perhaps the reversal of that interest rate cycle and perhaps at least start some sort of moderate decline, perhaps by a quarter or even a half percentage point by the first half of next year. It will perhaps be more of a political decision rather than an economic decision, but then when you are the incumbent political party, you can pressurize even an independent institution like the South African Reserve Reserve Bank going forward. So I think the interest rate cycle at its high now for now until the first quarter perhaps of next year when politics takes over. Politics, of course, has played a big role in South Africa for the last few years or so. The poor economic performance, load shedding, all the rest of it. Uh, you know, South Africa has been grappling with those domestic problems. Of course, she's also been grappling with her position on the global stage as well. We see now in the course of the last uh, few months or so the uh, difficulty South Africa has had with explaining her neut neutral position when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine war, South Africa being called to account 
account by uh, the United States, and in particular the U.S. ambassador to South Africa, and as a result, the possible risk to South Africa of losing her AGOA preferred uh, trade uh, position with the United States in future. I don't think South Africa is going to lose that AGOA position, by the way. I think it's in the United States' best interest to keep South Africa on the AGOA list. If you want leverage into South Africa and you don't want to drive South Africa diplomatically even further into the Chinese or non-aligned camp, you want to keep that leverage. So I would certainly advise the Americans not to remove South Africa from that preferential trade list going forward. But South Africa has punched above her weight in terms of her BRICS membership going forward. She has another opportunity now with the BRICS summit coming up in the next couple of weeks or so to continue to punch above her weight. The BRICS organization itself is likely to want to become an alternative power source in the world to the West a new, what I would call, non-aligned movement. Some of you are old enough to remember the non-aligned movement from the 1960s and 1970s. And I think BRICS is looking to be just that, to provide an alternative to the power structures of the West. South Africa ideologically likes that, China likes that, Russia certainly likes that, the Brazilians certainly like that at the moment, and even the Indians who like to play all sides of the dipl diplomatic equation, and they do it very well, they all like that as well. So watch out for BRICS becoming an expanded group, but certainly I think what we are likely to see is no common BRICS currency. I don't think that's practically feasible. I do think that BRICS is going to become something of a a political bulwark against what one could call the Washington consensus that certainly irritates many in our government here and for many in other parts of the developing world as well. So watch out for that in future. Now, that's kind of, you know, kind of the, the difficult part of South Africa, which all of us are experiencing. Are there any lights at the end of the tunnel? But, but in the distance, mind you, it is getting brighter in that particular graphic. Now, the lights at the end of the tunnel are there. Make no mistake. If you think I've been pretty negative up until now, I have been negative because that's the reality of the position. But I think that we are seeing a substantial change in South Africa. Firstly, we're seeing corporate CEOs speak up and speak up as they should about the deteriorating position within the country. That's important. It's important that, in a sense, we are not all here to be nice to one another. We are here also to be activists in our own right. And we've seen corporate South Africa begin to become, uh, have a more activist base to it. But equally, we've seen government prepared now to talk to the private sector and to engage the private sector on practical ways to improve, in particular, service delivery from our ailing state-owned enterprises within the country. And I have to say, I get quite excited about this, because I think this was long needed within South Africa. There's been a, a long-standing suspicion from government to the private sector, and from private sector to government. Now I think the crises that we've had in terms of the data that I've shown you is pushing these two critically important components of our society towards each other. And you've seen just in the course of the last month or two, 110 of our major corporate entities uh, sign a pledge or a pact with government, a practical pledge with government to assist in providing expertise to uplift these ailing aspects of our economy. It one is one of the more dramatic examples of public-private cooperation that I've spoken about for years that I've seen anywhere in the world recently. It's very public. Yes, there is suspicion from both sides. Yes, I'm not quite sure how much leeway the state will give the private sector in order to really come to the party, but put those suspicions aside. And as you can hear, I'm a skeptic. I am quite impressed with what we've seen here now. And let's hope that this bears fruit as it does, because it's, it's reportable. Private sector meeting with government, reportable on a six-weekly basis to get updates on aspects of the ailing economy and to send private sector expertise into the state.
So if I get any excited about anything in South Africa, it is that particular issue. And also the potential for the private sector to begin to influence policy making in South Africa to take us away from being reliant upon the state for everything to really embracing this public-private participation going forward. And we are seeing it. So in case you think I've been negative, we are beginning to see shifts. Our key transportation, Transnet, looking as though there are aspects of privatization coming into port management, particularly in the critical port of Durban. This is a big policy change for the ANC. It's, it's a leap away from the statist uh, view that the ANC has had. Not easy for the ANC to begin to move away from that the state is the answer to everything ideology, but we're starting to see that shift taking place, and we're starting to see a new breed of cabinet minister who understands the problems of infrastructure a lot more than some of the old guard within the ANC itself. And when you can't deal with the old guard effectively, but they remain politically powerful, you bring in some new guard to try and shake things up. And that is what we are seeing from government side as well. Now, on the energy sector, we've seen an intensity in power cuts, but we've also seen a moderate improvement in energy availability over the course of the last period. Now, it ebbs and flows depending on how cold the country gets, as all of us have experienced in the last few weeks or so. But that energy availability factor, just that little bit better now. As I like to caution when I say something positive, we also have to be careful because we're spending a lot of money on diesel to keep the lights on, and that's going to affect, obviously, the diesel budget going forward for the year. But look at the maps of South Africa and look to see how the energy position is shifting and changing. Renewables from wind to solar to other renewables mushrooming and blossoming in South Africa now that we've taken that step to open up to the private sector and to public-private participation in the energy sector in particular. Look at that. I mean, those are the, the private sector solar panels, solar installations, excuse me, I mean, really going through the roof, to use a rather corny cliche when it comes to solar installations. But look at the charts and look at the graphs. I mean, that really does show there is positivity on the issue of rebooting our energy sector. Yes, there is a rather complex ESCOM 2025 energy plan, which should put us on a load-shedding free basis by 2025. Can it be achieved? If you open up, if you deregulate, if you encourage your private sector, sure you can achieve this. And if you begin to fix those power units at Madupi Mudip, and Kusili that are problematic, and you bring in the necessary private expertise, I don't think it'll take that much for us to move into a more load-shedding free environment over the next 18 months or so. So, yeah, there's a bit of pain. Yes, the darkness is before the dawn, but I do see some dawn here on the energy horizon. There's a little bit of dawn when it comes to Transnet and the rail services that have been severely affected by a mismanagement in the course of the last few years. Passenger numbers are up, and that's important for us going forward. And again, as I've said, our GDP in South Africa certainly has not gone into negative territory despite low energy provision. So it's not all doom and gloom at all. And in fact, even when you look at some of our key industries that have been ailing for the last number of months, if not years, mining production in South Africa in the last month, mining production is up and manufacturing production is up as well. Two key aspects of our economy, despite stage four and stage six load shedding. So there is a certain resilience, again, in all of us to work within these constraints to look at improving South Africa. Lastly, on this particular issue, listen, the infrastructure deficit in South Africa is huge. Uh, government have said just in the last day that we need about a one and a half trillion rand to get our infrastructure back on track. One and a half trillion rand. Um, the um, International Monetary Fund have said that we can grow dramatically if we fix our basic infrastructure, particularly in energy, what an opportunity. When you look at that infrastructure backlog, uh, what an opportunity for all of us to get stuck in and to provide those essential services. When the state is as weak as it is 
at the moment, everyone, there's tremendous opportunity for all of us in all of our, all of our various endeavors as long as the state is willing to embrace us all in the private sector going forward. So the opportunity is there absolutely. The light is absolutely there even though it does seem a little dim at times. Finally, there's an election coming, as many of you know. Now, this election is a critical election for South Africa. For those of you from outside of South Africa, remember, South Africans are not used to changing their government. We had one government here, one party in power from 1948 until 1994. And we've had one government in power in South Africa from 1994 to 2024 next year. So we are not big on kicking out those who do not perform. In fact, we're not used to it at all. So there's an element of tension as we move into this election next year. It's an election for the first time in which the Party of Liberation cannot be guaranteed of getting 50% plus one in the vote going forward. And already, if you look at the support for the ANC at the polls, for the last 10, 15, 20 years or so, you see a slippage of the ANC. In the last local government elections, the ANC already got below 50% of the total vote already. So let's not be too shocked if the ANC struggles to get 50% in this election going forward. Let's look at voting intentions. You can see the slippage on the graph there, the slippage for the ANC, which is the blue line. Under 50% um, of South Africans are now saying in the recent um, Afrobarometer survey that they would vote for the ANC. Look at the opposition parties. Not doing particularly well either, I might add. It's not as though that ANC vote is dropping, but the opposition parties are not really spiking higher. They're treading water themselves. So one has to be a little cautious about expanding expecting an ANC defeat at the polls next year. I hasten to add that uh, when you are in power, the incumbent political party has still tremendous leverage, particularly in the South African position. So don't assume automatically that the ANC is going to lose support. But 74% of South Africans now, when asked whether they believe the country is going in the right or wrong direction, say the country is going in the wrong direction. And that's not a good poll result to have just about a year or a year and a half away from the election. So you are looking at different potential scenarios and outcomes for the vote in 2024. Uh, the opposition, the DA, would like there to be something called a moonshot pact which would enable the DA and smaller opposition parties to gain above 50% of the vote. I would refer to that moonshot pact as a long shot pact, actually. And I see the DA, have, they've decided to change the name of the moonshot pact as of last night, which I think is a wise move. Um, how the ANC manages the potential coalition partners it may need next year is going to be the critical issue for the ANC and potentially South Africa. If the ANC drops to below 50%, will they be prepared to do a deal with the EFF? Maybe. Will they be prepared to do a deal with the DA? I'll come to that in a moment. Or would they prefer to do a deal, if they get close enough to 50%, with a couple of smaller political parties that are not as aggressive as the EFF or the DA is? And I would say that for the ANC, your first prize if you don't get 50%, find some small guys who won't rock the boat, get them on board, and you'll have your 50% plus one majority, although it'll be a weak majority for the ANC going forward. But things are happening certainly in opposition politics. Gauteng, up for grabs. There's no guarantee the ANC will get 50% here. KwaZulu-Natal as well. A stronger working relationship between the IFP and the DA put that province potentially out of ANC hands, and that's very important symbolically uh, in terms of the role of opposition within South Africa going forward. The biggest surprise over the course of the last month or so has been talk within the ANC. Elements within the ANC now see the potential of working with the DA when it comes to a potential election outcome next year, almost creating some sort of grand coalition in which the ANC and DA would work together to stabilize South Africa. May not be such a bad idea, but maybe one really needs a government of national unity in South Africa to take us that bit forward. But fascinating statements coming through from the ANC Youth League, even from Fakili Mbalula, who possibly sees himself, I might add, as a potential president of South Africa, but he has to get over this guy first, who is the deputy president within the country. So, guys, it's not a negative scenario about the election at all. It opens 
opens up fluidity in our politics. It creates new scenarios for the future. And it does filter or it does diffuse the power of one political party who seems to be potentially now uh, prepared to enter into coalitions, not just with the EFF, potentially with the DA and other political parties as well. And that presents, for me, a very important light at the end of the tunnel for a policy reboot and a governance reboot into South Africa next year. So, I hope that you've, you've had some negatives from me, but I think, too, you see that the light before the dawn, the resilience and the hope, is absolutely present here in South Africa today. You know that you've got 60 million customers in this country, potentially, it's a population, a few hundred million on our doorstep, by the way, but 60 million in South Africa who want security, they want opportunity, they want finance, and they want to be, in many cases, entrepreneurs if they can find the right channels and the right regulatory framework in which to operate. And that's really where this company comes in and where all of you come in as well. In this adversity that we have within South Africa, the opportunity from a poor state, rejigging the state-owned enterprises, new political discourse for South Africa, much more ideological fluidity, less rigidity, all positives, all positives for South Africa going forward. Yes, it's a fasten your seatbelt story for all of us, but I've been here longer than many of you in this room. I've had my seatbelt fastened. Man, oh man, it never gets unfastened living in South Africa. But don't be deterred by the noise and even some of those charts that I've shown you. The hope and the opportunity remains, and ultimately you are here to serve our 60 million co-South Africans who are genuine in their interests in bettering their life. And if they do it through better financial products, through greater opportunity, and through better governance, which I hope will come through in the next year to two, I think we are going to start seeing those negative graphs that I've shown just begin to rise ever so slightly. I'm not here to tell you this is going to be a Singapore of Africa, but I am here to tell you that the light before, the light is the darkest now. I do see light going forward, and I do think that all of us need to play our role in providing the product, services, and activism needed in order to do that. Thanks so much for having me here today.